Today I'm working on 11 by 14 linen panel by Centurion. I have my drawing established on the board and I've toned it with a layer of raw umber. I'm going straight in and establishing the major dark areas and having those laid in will really help me evaluate things as I go. Right out of the gate, I want to set up what is perhaps the most labor intensive part of the painting, the slats on the door. There's no clever way to go about it except digging in, filling in the dark gaps between the slats, then the bright top sides of each of them. Now, although this is a big bright red door, I'm not just painting it with cadmium red straight out of the tube. There are lighter and darker areas where the sun hits it and falls away, where the paint might be slightly more chipped and faded. In particular, in the light areas, I'm being very conscious of how much white I'm using. This is because if you mix titanium white with a cad red, you'll get a chalky pink color. But what I want is a hot, bright red. This is why I've actually used a range of reds within the door, including Vermilion Extra, Cadmium Red Deep, and Alizarin Lake. Having that range will allow me to manipulate the value of the door, but maintain a feeling of punchy saturation and not let it get chalky. In the hottest areas, I'm using a mix of Vermilion Extra, Naples Yellow Deep, and a tiny bit of Kremnitz White, which is a more subtle and warmer tint than Titanium White. Now, a similar situation, as with the door, the local color of most of this facade is white, but we're not just going to paint this white. Similarly, as to when you paint snow, you know it's white, but it's not really white. It's a vast range of warm and cool grays. So in this instance, in the light areas, it's going to be these off-white creamy colors, and in the shadows, I saw a mix of drab grayish greens. So for a painting like this, apart from the door, color is very subdued and the greater emphasis is on strict value control and manipulating the light. Now I'm not being completely faithful to the photo reference that I took. I did take time to tweak it in Photoshop and reorganize the light so that it's raking from the top left down to the bottom right. And for my Patreon subscribers, I provide a layered PSD file for Photoshop to show how I set up my reference. Now, even in some of these earlier passages, I'm already trying to set up how I want a lot of the paint to do the work for me. I want to try and deposit the paint down and create a texture. Notice how I'm holding the brush quite far back. I have a gentle grip and I'm not pushing the paint into the surface. I just wanted to deposit on top to build up that texture. And in an area like this, where I want to emulate the effect of the beveled wall, I've mixed in a bit of liquid impasto with my paint mixture to, again, build up the texture. Once I had set up some of the lighter passages, I could see that I already went too dark in that car shadow under the arch. So I painted back into it, working more bounce light up and into the archway. It's during this blocking phase that being strict and procedural that I'm doing my best job at setting myself up for success. By working my way methodically up the value scale, going from dark to light, I'm going to get this all filled in as logically as possible. Sometimes I think that people might hear a word like procedure and run a mile, thinking that it might stifle creativity, though having a solid process, I feel, is the best way to not necessarily guarantee results, but at least give yourself the best chance at getting the best results possible. I'd like to emphasize how important the preliminary drawing is for me on a painting like this. For a landscape, you could possibly get away with doing a fairly loose lay-in of the composition. And if you're super fantastic, you can probably get away with doing a loose lay-in of a composition for an urban landscape. I don't fall into that group though. 
In a natural landscape with organic features like trees, rocks, and mountains, you can bend those things to your will and paint them in and out of a composition with somewhat ease. However, in this where we have relatively ornate architecture to deal with, I want to preserve and use my drawing as best as possible. It will eventually get lost in the paint, but I want to lose it at the right time when I have all the major forms and plane changes established. As I mentioned, I have adjusted my reference to suit the composition, and in doing that, I have framed this whole archway between two darker facades either side of it. And we get just a slither of each either side of the painting, and this will act as a really good framing element, so the whole composition can almost fall within a big capital H organization. And when dealing with an area like this, or I'm blocking in architectural shapes, one of my favorite brushes to use is a flat bristle, or in this case, it's an ivory by Rosemary Co. I think this is a size two, but use whatever the appropriate size is. I can get lots of straight lines, I can cut and carve shapes out, or I can use the edge and just the tip of the brush to create a fine point. Now, whilst it's not something that's heavily stressed in this painting, I do want to make a note about perspective. I will get into heavier duty videos on perspective down the road in future videos, but I will say that I am conscious of my horizon line and what is above and below it. It might sound obvious or silly, but at this level, around the lower half of the doorway, we can see down onto the steps and up into the underside of the archway. One of the main selling points of an architectural painting, you know, apart from color, value, composition, all of those things, is having perspective on point. Because when it's off, or when things start to look a bit wonky, as though reality isn't cooperating with you. Okay, and it is in an urban one where there are lots of straight lines. So as long as we don't lose sight of the mechanically precise things that are necessary for something like this, then we can actually loosen up, given how much texture is involved. And this is not pristine architecture. It's old and worn and the steps are chipped away and the stucco is crumbling off and we can have fun with that. So long as we don't lose sight of the underlying structure. As I said earlier, this is a painting with a greater emphasis on value control over color. As such, my palette is within a small gamut or range. I'll put a full list of my colors in the description down below but I am making heavy use of more earth tones like raw sienna, yellow ochre, burnt umber, and raw umber, and the whites are both titanium and lead based. Staying in that range will help me maintain color harmony throughout the piece. Here I've actually flipped the painting onto its side as it was the easiest way to do a second pass and refine those slats. By this point, I have the whole surface covered and the structure of everything laid in. It's at this stage that I feel confident in painting in that degradation, which really is often just a matter of indicating a value change, as a value change will signify a plane change. When a light edge meets a dark edge, then the surface goes bump. So if you've ever asked, how do I paint this or that texture or detail? Paint the underlying surface structure then paint the bumps on top. Now if you're enjoying this video, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. So here as I work on the archway, I want to show you how I tackle a layer of refinement or detail. When I get into ornate work like this, I really try to stop, look, and acknowledge what is happening in my reference. It is very easy to get lost in an area like this. Detail is really a highly intricate relationship between lots of dark and light values bunched together, indicating a lot of surface changes and a variable level of light on each surface. As you can see, I'm using a number of small brushes from a size one round or a double zero, and I'm adding complexity 
to the structural planes I've already laid down. That might mean that I'm subdividing one plane into two smaller ones, or on the underside of one of those curves on the arch, I'm painting in more bounce light, and by gently scumbling, I can gradiate it into the shadow side. This is really one of the main reasons why I paint in layers, because personally, I can't see everything at once, insofar as if I paint in stages, then I only have to think of a certain range of things at one particular time. At first, I can just lay in the structure. I'm just laying in the flat plane. And then eventually, I can go on top as I'm doing now. This top layer of paint is that added layer of complexity that if I try to get that in the first pass, I'm going to lose sight of everything else and it really won't come out well. Now there are painters out there that can go area by area um, painting somewhere completely to finish in the first pass and it looks wonderful. Um, but I'm not one of those. I have to think of each um, surface layer in stages. Something to be careful of when painting this dilapidated effect you might paint a dark spot like this, and at first you panic because you have this glaring thing that is drawing all of your attention away from the focal point. Don't worry. As you paint the rest of the effect, it will become part of an overall texture and will harmonize with the painting. It is at this point where I feel one needs to really dig in on a reservoir of patience. At first, it's possible to think that details are the fun bit. However, I personally feel like they're the most satisfying when they're done, but the most laborious to actually do. Like the little number 27 here, or the electric cables in the top right, they are very satisfying once done, but quite taxing in the moment. Maintaining a good reservation in your value budget means that you'll really be able to punch it up at the appropriate time. One of my teachers would say that you should invest time in your setup of midtones, then you'll have the luxury of turning on the lights, as in the case here of the steps. And after all of that setup, I get the payoff of painting in the figure. Again, this is a very small figure. The face is smaller than my thumb, so I'm going to paint this in stages to simplify it as much as I can. By that, I'm starting out with just some major structural plane changes to try to establish the form. I'm not even thinking about facial features at this stage. One of the biggest challenges of painting a face at this small scale is the nature of oil paint. It's slippery and buttery and you can get a big muddy mess. Hence why I build this up in stages to try and maintain that fresh look. And just as in a previous painting where I focused on a small figure in an environment, I'm not going for perfect likeness and lots of detail. I'm simplifying things down to the gesture and attitude of the character and my main focus is on light and shadow and form. Again, rather than perfect lightness, I'm going for a conveyance of character and an indication of expression. Eventually, I can go in and pull out the features of the nose and mouth. It gets away from me a little and actually starts to look like a pouty duck. 
So here I reestablish the drawing, paint back into it and treat it like clay, build up this larger form and carve out the features that I want. And honestly, it's not that different from painting the archway. You have this complex arrangement of shifting values that signify lots of plane changes. Once I have everything working, then I can really utilize some highlights to push the contrast on the figure, such as the rim light down her neck to separate her from the door. Then I have these three major highlights on the bridge of her nose, the nasal labial fold, that area just above the, the top lip, and then on the top side of her chin, those three forms pulled out, that's going to give me the essence of this character. Then I can pull out those final highlights of the fringe of the hair and her headscarf. In this case, I've simplified her jewelry or her ear loop down to just two values of a mid-tone gray to establish a shape and then a few highlights on top. Then I do the same treatment on the hands, pulling out a few highlights to accentuate the forms on the fingers and the ulna of the wrist. All of the heavy lifting in my work is done with direct painting to try to mix the right color in the right value and lay it down as best as I can. Sometimes though, I need to make a few tweaks and adjustments. And one way to do that is with glazing. This is where I use some transparent pigment like raw umber with a little medium like Winsor Newton Liquid Original. And here you'll see me deposit some paint with one brush and then scrub it into the surface with another. Doing this is going to help reinforce the direction of the light and fall off into shadow. It also allows me to deepen up the shadows wherever I see necessary on the painting. And this will allow me to do it without destroying everything I've done underneath it or completely repaint it in a darker value. And just a note, everywhere I do this is completely dry before I do this technique on top. I find glazing very useful towards the end of a painting to harmonize shadow areas and bring things together without having to completely rework an area. Well, thanks for watching and I hope you got some helpful advice on architectural painting. If you did, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And there are more videos if you'd like to carry on watching. Down below, you're going to find links to my Instagram, Patreon for exclusive content, and my website. Thank you so much, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.